afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Economic Development and Innovation Committee meeting. We have one item on our agenda today, which um, are social districts. So I will turn it over to Mr. Raleigh, I believe. Yes, good afternoon, Chairman Milton and members of the committee. Um, so we do have just one discussion item, social districts, and we have uh, with us today uh, a few folks. Um, First, uh, Mr. Andy Ellen, who is the president and general counsel of the North Carolina Retail Merchants Association, uh, is present with us to provide the committee with an overview of the legislation. Uh, I will also note that our city attorney's office has done quite a bit of uh, evaluation of this legislation. So Brandon Poole, our deputy city attorney, is also present to address any questions that may come up regarding the specifics of the legislation as well. Uh, and then after the conclusion of Andy's presentation, we have also with us uh, Mr. Bill King, president of the Downtown Retail, uh, excuse me, Downtown Raleigh Alliance, and uh, Mr. Jeff, Jeff Murison with uh, Hillsborough Street Services Corporation to provide some, uh, some uh, stakeholder input regarding this uh, legislation. So uh, at this point, I will turn the virtual floor over to uh, Mr. Andy Elk. I'm sorry, you think after two years of doing these that I wouldn't have myself on mute, so I apologize. Thank you, uh, Chairman Melton and Mayor Baldwin and Councilman Knight. Greatly appreciate the opportunity to be before you today. Uh, and I think Alan was going to, he's letting me share a screen, so hopefully my technology will work. So here, here we go. Let's see if we can do this. There we go. Um, so, um, Evan had asked that I, I provide a sort of an overview of how we got here and, and, and the background on the social districts and, and Bill King, I know is on here and Bill had hosted a webinar not too long ago with I think 65 of the, of the downtown revitalization groups throughout the state of North Carolina. So I've sort of, this is a sort of a, sort of a, what I've learned a little bit through that period of time. So backing up and how we got here, um, we actually had a member of ours from New Bern area called back in the fall of 2020 and had seen um, in Ohio and Michigan when he was doing some visiting up there, um, social districts. And it was some towns like Grand Rapids and, and some other areas in, in Michigan, Ohio that had developed these. And at that point in time, there were two major reasons they were doing it. One was because of COVID and people not wanting to be inside, um, you know, and they needed to be socially distanced and being outside was a way for them to support businesses downtown, but with also keeping people safe. And it was also, as, as many downtowns, you saw workers leave the downtown and work remotely, it was a way to try and get foot traffic back into businesses downtown. Um, and so actually the bill was later passed as, as uh, House Bill 890, but there was an original bill called House Bill 781. And the title of that bill was Bring Business Back Downtown. And the sponsors were uh, Representative Tim Moffitt from the Asheville area, Minority Leader Robert Reeves from Chatham County, uh, Representative Ben Moss from the Richmond County area, and Representative Chuck Tyson from, from Newburn area. And so we started working on this legislation with them and trying to develop, again, a way to try to help the downtown areas and bring business back downtown. That bill was filed on May the 3rd and passed the House of Representatives on May the 6th, so a pretty quick time frame, moved through the ABC committee, moved through one other committee onto the House floor and passed 103 to 7. Um, I've been doing alcohol legislation for almost 24 years. That's the most votes I've ever had in a House vote. Uh, most of the time it's 65, 55, or maybe you get 75 votes, but we had 103 votes in favor of this. Uh, one other piece that was important to us was we oftentimes see festivals and other things in downtowns. And I live in the town of Wake Forest, and we had this thing called Friday Night on White, um, but retail permittees, their alcohol permit is tied to the premises. So they're having festivals outside, or you think about the Bluegrass Festival and other things, the businesses that are on downtown Fayetteville Street, for instance, they can't really participate in those events because their premises is tied again to their, or their permits tied to their existing premises, whereas a wholesale or a brewery's permit is not necessarily tied. So they get to watch all this business going on around them downtown but they can't sell a, a, a beer and a cup for the customer to go outside into the street. They watch out of town vendors oftentimes come into the area and then leave with those dollars. 
So we see that also in my town, like I said, on wait, Friday night on white, the first Friday of every, every Friday beginning in May, where we'll have 10,000 people in downtown Wake Forest and the vendors on the street, the permanent businesses there aren't really able to participate. So that was one of the other reasons we were trying to work on this for wine shops, wine, uh, bottle shops, breweries, restaurants, those sort of things. So the bill, as, as mentioned, it, was, it became part of House Bill 890, which was an ABC omnibus bill, contained a number of other provisions. Um, some of you've seen about, you know, be allowing to distilleries to be open on Sunday, for instance. Um, but it had the social district provision in. And, and one thing that was very important to a number of legislators was they didn't want a statewide social district. They wanted towns and counties and cities the ability to opt in to a social district and have a social district should they want one. Um, and you see the two citations for both the counties and the cities there. Um, so let's see if we can move to the next one. So social district legislation defines it. You know, it's a defined outdoor area defined by the local government, which a person can consume alcohol beverages sold by an ABC permittee. Um, it doesn't necessarily include the ABC's permittee license premises or the extended area under the new restaurant provision that we that were, was also, you know, driven by COVID. Um, and I apologize here. I've got one spelling error. The spell check got me on these. So, so far we've seen these are the municipalities with social districts, Kannapolis, the town of Norwood, Greensboro, uh, which goes into effect next week. Sylvan, I apologize. That was my, my spelling error where spell check got me. And the town of, of Newton out in Catawba County, um, a number of cities are exploring this. Salisbury's got formed a task force on it. Durham is, is strongly looking at it. Waynesville, uh, Albemarle is, is already in discussions about it. So is Charlotte. And I was in conversations last week with High Point. Um, I will say, if somebody would have told me what will be the first town out of the gate for a social district in North Carolina, I would not have said Kannapolis. But they put it in place the week after the law went into effect, basically. Um, the second one I would have probably not said would have been Norwood, North Carolina and Stanley County, um, but their downtown development officer was was very uh, enthusiastic about it, very energetic, was participated in Bill's webinar and, uh, and, and they have put one in place already. I will say the Kannapolis police chief has made several comments in the media that uh, that this was there have been no problems. It's, it's worked very well. They've had no issues at all to this point. Um, Moving on, sort of what this, the, the restrictions on this, on the social district, and these are all set out in the legislation. Um, you got to clearly define it with, and post signs conspicuously located that says this is the area where you can and cannot consume alcoholic beverages, um, which would include the signage would have to include, you know, the area that you can, that, that is, that comprises the social district, what the hours are, and, and the hours are subject to the current ABC laws. A city or a county can can decide, however, within these hours or days that they would like to have for the social district. But generally, it's the hours that you can sell alcohol is what is allowed. Again, then the city can reduce that if they would like. But it's generally Monday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 2 a.m., Sunday, 12 p.m. to 2 a.m., unless the town is done or the city is done earlier Sunday sales like the city of Raleigh has. Again, you don't have to use all of those hours. Some, some have, some have not, uh, but that would be completely up to the city. Um, you got to provide a telephone number for ALE or local law enforcement should there be an issue. And then a statement that, you know, the alcohol purchased for consumption in that area shall only be consumed inside the social district. You're not allowed to take it outside the social district and that you're supposed to dispose of it before you, uh, before you exit the social district. Uh, and that's unless you're, you're reentering the ABC premises where you bought the actual beverage. And that will be a key component that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, Requirements, further requirements, um, you know, they, the city is supposed to have, you know, what's what's your maintenance plan ensure and you're supposed to put it on the website of how you're going to sort of maintain and, and monitor the area. Uh, again, you want to do it in a way that this is not intended to be a, a New Orleans Mardi Gras type atmosphere. It's, you know, it is supposed to be done in a responsible way, maintain the public health safety welfare of the general public is the way it's supposed to be designed. And again, part of that goes back to the hours and the the size of the social district. Um, you also must file with the ABC commission. You, there's not a new permit from the ABC commission or anything like that, but you have to file an information or form with the ABC commission that, that shows what the hours of the, of the, of the social district are and, uh, and a map of where it is located just for their records. And so in case they need to do any sort of enforcement as well. Um, 
continuing on. Um, who can sell alcohol in these uh, in the social district? Generally, it's it's anybody with a, with a premise on premise permit, which would include on premise malt beverage, on premise unfortified wine, on premise fortified wine, mixed beverage, and distillery permit. I would also point out that sometimes we think about off premise permittees. Um, or what we think is of as an off-premise permittee oftentimes also has an on-premise permit. And if you think about, for instance, um, I'll use Raleigh Wine Shop, for instance, they've got an on-premise malt beverage permit. Um, even though they, they are traditionally thought of as, a, as an off-premise venue that you buy a bottle of wine or six-pack of beer to go home with, as a, as a wine shop, they would, most of the time, businesses like that uh, maintain an on-premise, so they would also be eligible for something like this as well. Um, let's see. Additional rules. Um, the permittee must be located in or contiguous to the social district, so right there beside of it. Um, and then this is a big piece, and, and, and this was got a lot of discussion in the House ABC committee, and it was about the cup. And there's a picture of one of the cups from one of the towns or a couple of the towns where we pulled those off of. It's got to clearly identify the ABC permittee, and, and that is in case, you know, the, the person is, is encountered and they're intoxicated or that they are underage, it gives law enforcement some ability to identify where that beverage came from. Um, it's got to clearly display the logo that's unique to the social district. So something that says this purple, like the purple cup, this is a cup that can be used in a social district. You don't, if, if the purple cup is the one that's used in the district and you see somebody with a red solo cup, you know that they have not properly purchased the beverage and they may have brought it from somewhere else, uh, from their house or somewhere else. No glass, obviously, you don't want those broken in the streets for safety purposes. And then, um, and this is a statement that you'll see throughout a lot of the ABC law. You see it on advertising and some other things of, uh, you know, a statement on the back of its own growlers, for instance, uh, the drink responsibly B21. It's got to be at least 12 point font. And, you know, the cup has got to be no more than 16 ounces, fluid ounces. So it's not going to be, a, you know, a huge, large, you know, um, cup or, or, or some sort of, you um, jug or anything like that. Um, so permittee, if, if you cannot let, if I, for instance, go to, and I'm looking below our office on Fable Street, if you had one here, I couldn't let somebody from the foundation take a cup and come into the anchor bar or come into Big Easy across the street. You can only re-enter the plate with the cup, the place that you bought the item. So um, cannot go into another, a, a different ABC permittee. And that's a key, a key component. And, and again, a lot of this law, we, we sort of mirrored off of Michigan and Ohio. And that has, was, was very consistent with what they had done in those areas as well. Um, business participation, um, you know, the, you do not have to participate in this. You know, in, in all the venues that we talked about, this isn't something that's forced on somebody. They don't have to. They don't have to participate in the social district if they don't want to, um, you know. But it is open to, you know, any business within that area or contiguous to it may participate. Um, and again, you can't allow somebody in with another with a cup from somewhere else that's not where you purchased it from. Even if you're not participating in it, you can't. You cannot take that AB, that cup into a different ABC permittee. Um, for customers, and I think this is part of an educational piece. Um, you know, you can't possess or consume outside of the social district. Uh, you can't bring personal beer or wine, you know, from your house to bring it into the social district. Uh, you got to drink it in the required container, um, you know, only during the hours of operation, subject to the same sales limitations. So you, you can't go into a bar and get four beers in, a, in the four social district cups because you're limited in North Carolina to two beers at one purchase or two glasses of wine at one purchase. And this is another key component before you exit the social district, which is why the mapping and signage is so important and also some trash receptacles. Most likely you, you must dispose of your cup before you before you exit that area as well. Um, then lastly, you know, a couple of FAQs that we've gotten recently, um, you know, that do you want to put up some sort of signage at the entrance of your business? certainly would be up to the business if you'd like to do it. We've seen in some towns, they've, they've done a designated sticker that goes on the window that shows the business is participating. Um, are you liable? You know, if, if alcohol is given to, uh, to somebody that's underage, this doesn't change the alcohol rules as far as 
underage sales, selling to an intoxicated person, all those are still applicable. No way does it change that at all. Um, and I remember Representative Greg Meyer from uh, from Hillsborough area actually gave the example of, he said, you know, it may actually help in some areas with underage drinking because we don't know what's in some people's cups. We know at least that they got the social district cup. They bought it from a licensed entity and they, they have, uh, you know, gone through an ID check and some of that. It may actually help law enforcement somewhat um, other than rather than the way we currently are, are, are dealing with things. Um, you know, somebody has also asked, you know, are you considering the law enforcement entering your premises? Again, no different than today. If, if the law enforcement believes that the law has been broken, whether it's ALE or ABC enforcement or local law enforcement, they certainly have the right to enter. One piece that I meant to put up here on there and just one other one is, and we've had, and again, a lot of this was, a, it was attempting to drive foot traffic into places that were especially affected by the COVID. Um, but you also have businesses that are located that may not be an ABC permittee. Um, you know, a hardware store, a women's boutique, a bookstore that does not have an ABC permit, you know, they are also free to allow somebody into the business or not come in. If I sell, you know, uh, furniture, I may not want customers coming in with glasses or uh, cups of red wine to sit on my white couches. That may not be, you know, very good for my business model. Um, but if I'm selling, a hard, if I'm a hardware store or I'm a bookstore and somebody wants to peruse the book section, of my store, and I don't have a permit. That's certainly you know allowable under this, uh, as we understand it. Um, I will say, and Bill King can probably speak to this more. Bill did a really good webinar um, again with 65 downtown uh, officials. But I think the the other really good thing that he had, and, and I sent this I think to to Evan, was he had uh, officials from Mobile, Alabama, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, which actually has four social districts, and then Grand Rapids, Michigan. And they should, you know, they talked about some of their experiences and how well it had worked and how, you know, had, people had been responsible. They had not had any problems. Um, and, and in some cases, I think they were a little bit surprised at, at how well it had the uptick on it. Um, but they did feel like, and, and it's the same thing that we heard from the Annapolis police office, our chief and some of the quotes was it had helped bring business back to some of the downtowns and had helped with foot traffic, especially for some of the the restaurants and others that have been so detrimentally affected by COVID-19 um, and during some of the, the shutdowns and some of the, the restrictions. And so, it, you know, overarching, if that's what you're trying to do and help drive some traffic into some of these areas, this is certainly something, you know, that that, it, that works out. And again, I think in, in a lot of cases, it, it's a much more scaled down version to things that you do in the city of Raleigh to try and drive tourism and traffic, which is, Things like the Bluegrass Festival, things like Brugaloo, things, you know, some of the other art meet in the street art festivals, art explosure, you know, where that is available. It's very similar. You were you were trying to create, you know, again, people coming into the downtown and the foot traffic of it or people coming from out of Raleigh and into the downtown to to enjoy an area, especially on a nice spring summer day. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions um, and, or if I miss something, please let me know and. Uh, if I did, or if I didn't touch on anything, but uh, but I appreciate very much, again, Chairman Melton, the opportunity to be with you today, and, and, and Mayor Baldwin and Councilman Knight. Great. Can we get the um? Can we get the thank you? Sorry, ahead of me. Can everybody hear me? Because this is an ongoing problem with my. Okay, good. Um, I know we have some other folks from the community on. Um, I know Mr. Murison is here. Mr. King is here. Um, do y'all have, um, I guess, items you want to add to the presentation, or do you want us to ask questions? Um, Bill or Jeff, you can jump in. Uh, is there anything that you, why don't we start with Bill? Bill, is there anything you want to add, or would you, do you want us to just ask questions, or how do you want to do this? Uh, I just have, a, I have like two slides that I was just going to show a little bit on what we've, um, oh, great. On what Andy uh, said. So um, if I am allowed to share those, give me a second to see if I can make that okay. work. And while you're doing that, um, Bill, Mr. Raleigh, is are, is it just uh, Bill and Jeff or is there anybody else from one of the from from the community uh, logged on to? Uh, so my understanding, uh, Chairman Melton, we do have one person, I believe, that signed up to speak. That individual uh, did not attend the meeting, sir. He okay. did sign up, he did not attend. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chavis. So uh, these are th this is it, then, uh, Chairman Melton. 
Okay, so why don't we hear from Bill and then Jeff, and then we'll kick it over to for discussion and questions. All right, go ahead, Bill. Okay, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, uh, as Andy mentioned, we held, hosted a webinar uh, back in late fall uh, with other downtown organizations throughout the state just to get a sense of what the legislation um, does and then start to kind of ideate together on um, items for consideration, what we should be thinking about, uh, questions. We heard from those other cities on lessons learned. Um, so we, we've begun that process. Uh, obviously, there's a, a good bit more to do, but I just want to share a little bit on some of the items we saw for consideration um, and then some potential um, steps um, to help sort of answer some of these questions. So um, certainly, you know, in terms of items for consideration for community, uh, the boundaries for these districts and a criteria for where districts go, that's something obviously um, council, you know, will, will need to help us figure out is, you know, what would that look like if these are of interest? Um, where would these potentially go? What what are good boundaries? Um, different cities have done it different ways, um, but that would be certainly a consideration of uh, first and foremost, where is this district or districts? Um, you know, the inclusion of uh, our parks, you know, in, in let's say if there were a downtown district or parks included or other facilities um, in the downtown area included, whether that's transit or others, that would need to be a consideration for, for clarity. Again, some cities have done it where everything is included, some uh, carve those out. Obviously, enforcement will be of interest for, for the police department, so um, their input would be very important. Then, obviously, gauging interest, so you'd want to make sure nearby residents um, are engaged and included and understand um, what this district would mean and, and what it would look like for them. Uh, it's certainly important to gauge business interest, um, so that would be very uh, critical to see if businesses want to participate. And also, as Andy mentioned, businesses can opt out, so if you're a non-ABC business, uh, and you don't want people coming in with drinks, you can opt out of it, but you know, we'd want to understand that a little bit better. So that would be part of an engagement process on this. Uh, signage uh, is mentioned in there. So where that is, what that looks like, um, who uh, puts that up, that would require some work. Uh, trash and disposal of cups. Uh, certainly we want to make sure we've got a plan around that. Uh, obviously hours of operation and days of the week. So these have varied a bit across the state um, and Aligning those with what the community's interest in would be really important. Um, making sure the costs are, are made clear, who, who bears the cost on these cups and the signs and receptacles and things like that uh, would be an important part of this. Understanding the interaction with special event permits. So as Andy mentioned, uh, you know, in normal times when a special event comes, they have something of an open container atmosphere, but you have to purchase from uh, that event, the businesses themselves can't uh, be engaged on that. So understanding how these interact with special event permits will be important, uh, obviously insurance and liability, and then just incorporating a, any other lessons learned from from other cities. So, you know, some potential steps, um, you know, we've been working on a task force of community members to discuss questions. Obviously, we would do that if there's interest um, in these districts from the city. Um, I think there's certainly would need to be some inner engagement from RPD, parks, the attorney's office, transportation, special events, and, and other departments likely too, uh, to help answer some of those considerations I just provided. Uh, I think before deciding to do a district, it's critical to do engagement of residents and businesses. So um, I wanna be clear, we've not done uh, this work yet. We wanted to get a sense of, you know, what the city's appetite was and interest in this. Um, and then, you know, that's something we can help with. The gauge is this of interest for, you know, uh, downtown or parts of downtown to better understand that. Um, the city would need to help set guidance on what, what they want boundaries to be established as. I think uh, between these various groups, answers on costs, you know, like I said, for the cups and the you know, trash and things like that, enforcement, signage, how it interacts with those special event permits, responsibilities around these would need to be clear. If there are any metrics for impact, um, setting those would be important. And then obviously at the end of this, if there is interest in doing these, the boundaries and hours being set by council um, would be interested. So there's a lot of different directions to go here. If, if there were an interest in doing a district, certainly economic impact is something that can be measured. We measure uh, economic impact by uh, sub district in downtown. So you can see we do Fayetteville Street and Moore Square and Warehouse District in Glenwood South. So obviously there's ways to set that, um, uh, but that would be obviously part of the discussion and, and an area where um, guidance and clarity would be needed. So um, it's real brief uh, show from me, uh, but just wanted to show that we've done some thinking um, and are here to be partners and listen uh, and be helpful in any ways that we can um, in continuing this conversation. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, Jeff, do you have anything you'd like to add? I, I wanna put you on the spot, but 
appreciate you being here. Do you have a slide or any additional information you want to throw in? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do have a, a brief uh, statement, you know, that uh, to share with the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share with you our current um, uh, views regarding creation of social districts, uh, particularly in the Hillsborough Street community area. Um, as you know, that the legislation uh, was passed last year and um, uh, it was designed to be an economic development tool to help our merchants. We generally believe uh, that um, it would be a beneficial tool, uh, particularly for food and beverage establishments. Um, shortly after the law was passed, uh, as you've heard, the Downtown Raleigh Alliance and the North Carolina Downtown Development Association, of which Bill and I are both board members, um, started to help our industry by having a webinar on the event. After that, I introduced this concept to the Hillsborough Street Board um, as an emerging issue for their consideration um, to help them get up to speed on it. The executive committee and the board have had a number of preliminary conversations about the pros and cons of social districts along Hillsborough Street, uh, but have not uh, come to a, 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 permit, a, a conclusion. As you can imagine, uh, there's a range of perspectives from strong support to significant apprehension. Uh, and so the board hasn't taken a formal position uh, on if a social district should be established along the corridor. It's fair to say that there was significant concern, uh, especially given our proximity to NC State and Meredith College. Um, we intend to have additional conversations and, and, and listen to our stakeholders uh, to get their perspective on the value of um, this along our corridor. At this time, with regard to the possibility of the creation of a district along uh, our corridor, we suggest council take a thoughtful, uh, deliberative review of the pros and cons that are unique to our area of the city, especially given our you know, close relationship with NC State and Meredith College. That being said, we do believe that a pilot project district somewhere in the city uh, would be very helpful and would be a way to help evaluate the impact uh, of social districts and if they would have benefits to other parts of the, the city in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, well, I guess, I mean, maybe speaking out of term, I'm just gonna jump in. Um, you, you use the buzzword that I know the mayor loves, which is the pilot program. And I think certainly something new that other cities are exploring like social districts, I think it probably lends itself very well to, to trying to come up with a pilot. And so just for purposes of framing the committee discussion today, I'd like to throw out there that I think we should um, explore a pilot. And you know, just from the chart Bill put up, I think the Fayetteville Street area would make perfect sense for this. Cause I know that's an area that we have had ongoing discussions about how to increase foot traffic and revitalize that area. There's a lot of public plazas. Um, there are bars and restaurants over there. That's a space where we already tend to use for things like Boogaloo and, and food truck rodeos. And I think it could be, um, I think it could do a lot of good. I think the infrastructure lends itself nicely with the very wide sidewalks and everything. So um, I would be interested in, in exploring a pilot on Fayetteville Street. Um, so that's sort of where I'm at. I think it may be even beneficial if we have this task force look at the boundaries, you know, maybe extending a little beyond Fable Street onto onto Wilmington and Salisbury too, where we've got some shops and stuff. But that's those are my thoughts. I see Councilmember Knight's hand up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, uh, I I have always been supportive of this idea conceptually, and um, I think it's a good one. I've, I've seen it. We've all seen it work well in in other states and other other cities of our size so it's certainly something we need to move forward to move forward with and i think i think quick quick quickly um we have a have a lot to lean on a lot of other cities to look at uh, who have done this and done it successfully so i think we need to move and move you know uh quickly you know maybe one area at a time that's the way you kind of make a pilot just let's focus on either you know Glenwood South or Fayetteville Street and, and go from there and get that worked up and then we'll learn from that and move to the next one. Two specific questions um, though, and maybe uh, Mr. Ellen, uh, long time, good to see you again. Uh, and not go way back to the legislative days. Um, it, would you put up there again, your, uh, if there was a definition of uh, these, uh, I've already forgot the name, what, is it, what are they called, social areas? Because I got two specific questions of how this is, these have worked in other places if you don't mind okay uh, let me see. i'm gonna i'm gonna try 
Councilman Knight. Let me see if I can get it back up there real quick and get uh, let me get backwards. I think it was back on the second. And as you're going there, my two my two questions are one, there was obviously a lot of conversation around alcohol consumption, but about um, but I want to know more about the food, how that works. Is it consistent with on site, off site? Um, you know, uh, storefronts, uh, you know, the whole issue of food trucks and, um, uh, uh, you know, hot dog stands, for example, um, how you make those consistent and fair, I guess, I guess it's just, just something to raise. And then the other question that I've always been intrigued by on all this is, you know, with Glenwood South already in the, in the mood it is, um, vehicular traffic to me is a very interesting part of this where I think could hold back some of these areas. So how does that work in terms of, um, again, is it specific per place that we decide where to do it in terms of, I just don't think most of these places you need vehicular traffic coming through the middle of it, such as on the Glenwood South, for example, uh, but how has that worked in other places? Okay, and so I, I put up the definition of, of social district, which is contained in 18B904.1. So it's a defined outdoor area you know, yeah. that, that you as, a, as the city would define um again which somebody can can consume alcoholic beverages sold by a permittee um and remember that permits are generally not not they don't move they're not transportable um based in in the law sets out in that section in, in 18b 901.1a1 specific permittees and so you know it's an on-premise malt beverage permit it's an it's these businesses that are brick and mortar that are located inside or contiguous to that district so um you know you i wouldn't think you would have sort of the food truck issue i think you're going to have businesses you know again as i if, if we did as chairman melton mentioned out my front door you know places like raleigh times um anchor bar foundation big easy they would certainly be eligible as having those type of permits that allow them to sell within sort of that defined social district um I'm not sure that answers your question, but that's that is sort of how, how it's defined. Um, do you want me to move on to the other question? So, or? so I guess, so, you know, one thing I think we should think about is not looking at this. I get that where the legislation came through. It came through sort of like it or not, the alcohol ABC um, area of the law or, but I would love for us to look at this idea, not through a lens of really alcohol focused, Right. Plus, obviously, we want to make these family friendly and we don't want it to be and we, you know, we've all been there. We've all seen how these work in other places. But I think the focus should be on on socializing right with with, you know, which obviously right. includes all ages and members and of families. And so making it as family friendly as possible. So I do think that, you know, the 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 food aspect of it needs to be thought through too. what's fair what's you know equitable in terms of selling and buying food uh as well as other types of beverages uh as well as just safety aspects of it and that's where i think the vehicular traffic uh aspect of this comes into place too about how free we can make these areas for people to be able to walk around and roam so i think that's just something to keep in mind uh as we go through this and not look at it only through the lens of alcohol consumption so Councilman Knight, I think you're exactly right. I, I missed part of that. I, I misunderstood part of your question. I think of it somewhat of, um, and sometimes I trail my wife like this, and they want to go, my wife and daughter want to go in this store and that store, and I may not want to go in this store and that store, but I don't want to stay at the one place where I was if I have half a glass of wine left. You know, this allows me to take that and walk down the street, and hopefully maybe they walk into Deco Raleigh, uh, you know, or, or, you know, another store operation, or maybe we, we, my kids want to go buy bittersweet and get something to eat where I can stand out and, you know, they can have dessert and I can stand out on the sidewalk uh, and do that because I can't take that beverage back in. But I, you know, um, but it would allow you to sort of hopefully drive some of that foot traffic, as you said, not only around the alcohol side of it, but around other retail, other food, other, other items. Uh, or if you, you know, you come downtown and, and, um, one person wants to eat city and one wants Raleigh times, it may give you an opportunity to get both without having to go be, be in that restaurant if my wife wants one and I want something of the other. Uh, so I think food aspect, but I think also just generally um, 
you know, walking and, and doing other business in that area would certainly be, be available. Yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it. Thank you. Can we get the um, presentation down? Um, yes. Sorry. And I would just add, you know, and I think someone mentioned this, that if we move forward, part of the consideration for the task force will be how do the social districts interact with the special with the permits and the festivals that we're already doing. And so I think a little bit of it is this social district's not intended to be this is a special weekend, this is a special day, we're doing it. This would just sort of lay on top of everyday life in these areas and it would become sort of a new normal. And so, you know, I think closing streets to vehicular traffic is a probably a whole separate issue. Um, you know, Fayetteville used to be closed to vehicular traffic, then it got opened and there's talk about what do we do moving forward. But in the interim, why I think a pilot would work in that area is because there are tons of public plazas and the sidewalks are really, really wide. And, and, and there's not sort of a critical mass of foot traffic and, and people there already right now. Whereas Glenwood South, we're doing really well on Glenwood South and some other areas of the city in the warehouse district, we're doing really well there. Fable Street, and it was before COVID, you could walk down Fable Street on a Saturday and not see another person. And I think that's the situation we're trying to address. And there are shops over there and there are restaurants over there. And if we could create a situation where folks can have a glass of wine and socialize and shop and hang out. You know, I went to Savannah for my bachelor party before I got married because it was a fun environment where we knew we could hang out and socialize outside. And we don't have something like that here. And I think Fayetteville Street would be a good spot to, to pilot it. So that, that's my thought on it. Mayor, do you have anything to add? I have several thoughts. Um, Go ahead. First off, um, first, my first question is, have we reached out to the Midtown Raleigh Alliance to determine if there's any interest um, in that area? Mayor, we have not uh, at this point, and I don't know if, if uh, Bill or Jeff have had any conversations with that the, that leadership, but I uh, I have not yet. But certainly, that's something that we could do, you know, as a as a next step in this discussion. If that's something the committee would like us to, you know, this topic is something the committee wants us to continue to explore. I think that that is something that should take place um, to explore that option. Um, I'm just going to say I'm, I would not support um, a district of this sort on Glenwood South. Um, Glenwood South is already Glenwood right. South. Um, I'm kind of looking at this more like an opportunity to help um, add energy and um, to the downtown. And the district that really um, needs some help right now is Fayetteville Street. Um, I would like to see, you know, when people start coming back to the office, um, this would be one way to keep them excited about coming back to downtown. So for me, and I've shared this with um, Evan Raleigh several times, I believe, energizing the public realm is one of the most important things we can do right now um, to get people excited about coming back to the office, coming back downtown, whatnot, we have to treat that with a sense of urgency. So um, I would be supportive of looking at Fayetteville Street as a pilot program. You're right, um, <laughs> Chair Melton, that my favorite term, um, but a pilot program I think would be appropriate. Um, I also want to say having um, dealt with in committee for a while, the whole drunk town um, dilemma. Um, I think pulling together a task force made up of residents and business owners would be um, very important um, because you don't want people being surprised. You want them to have input. And so, um, Bill, that would fall on your shoulders. Um, and I don't know if there, the city would be involved as well. Um, but I think that that is a necessary step to make this work. Um, and finally, I think that we need to, uh, okay, I'm going to go back to another favorite saying, um, people can't love what they can't see. And I'm just thinking out loud here. But perhaps we give this a try on Fayetteville Street 
at um, an upcoming event. So kind of like piloting the pilot, if you will, um, and seeing how it would work, learning from it, learning from the experience. So that would be another suggestion I would have. Um, Bill, I don't know when our next big event is downtown. Um, do you have any idea? Uh, I'm not certain off the top of my head. There, there may be St. Patrick's Day related events. Um, I know there would be at some point in April, Brugaloo would take place. Now, of course, challenge there is with these events that they have their own special event permit. That means they have their own ABC um, permit. So in some respects, they do um, offer that opportunity. The, the challenge is they don't offer it through the businesses. So, of course, they would be bringing in their own alcohol vendor and you'd be buying directly from them. So the businesses wouldn't necessarily be able to participate under current um, regulations. I could be wrong about that, but I believe that's the, the case um, without a social district being implemented. And I think there's still some work to be done to figure out exactly how special events and social districts interact. I'm not an expert on that part of uh, the legislation. Um, good. Well, I think just, I think that doing it during events, um, I mean, that's what I've heard from a lot of people is when you go to an event downtown, how can you go? You can't walk from place to place. You've got to just stay right where you are. And that's frustrating. So I don't know. I, I guess we would have to figure that out. Um, Jeff, I saw you you jumping in. Yeah, I was going to uh, agree with Bill about the and the mayor about the the, the coordination of these with special events. Um, we have special events on our street, some that have um, uh, uh, beer uh, garden uh, uh, available. Um, and that creates that tension between our existing um, infrastructure merchants. Um, so I think if there's a way to uh, clarify that and make them be able to be part of that, that's a win-win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is I think there is consensus in committee that we would like to do a pilot um, on Fayetteville Street, but that we need to do the pull together the task force to get ahead of any drunk town issues, I guess, um, work with um, residents and businesses in that area. So it sounds like we've got a, a good chunk of work we have to do, and I think it's going to have to happen in pieces. Um, and then as far as the committee's concern, my preference would be to keep this item in committee and to check back and get it to where we can make sort of a holistic final recommendation to council. So I think that our work here is just starting. And what I'm sounding, what it sounds like is that between now and the next meeting, perhaps we can um, do some assignment of duties, figure out how to pull the task force together. Maybe in the next meeting, we could look at what a what a boundaries may look like because that may help determine the 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 input that we get. Uh, I'm just thinking out loud here. Is everybody does, does that sound right? That we should that we should the consensus from today is Fayetteville Street pilot task force for engagement, and we need staff to come back with some more concrete ideas on the signage and the time and the boundaries. Does, does that sound right to everybody? Well, I I'm wondering if um... First off, Bill, uh, what is your vision for um, starting this committee? What what are you what are your thoughts? I think on our side, the you know what we saw is that committee would really be the opportunity for community engagement. So that would be that discussion with residents and businesses. So we've not had that discussion yet with do businesses want to do this? You know, are residents aware of this? So that's where I'd see that committee um, having some of those representatives on it and then doing some of that engagement. Um, concurrently, there does need to be some work, I think, with some of those um, city departments identified on issues around enforcement, um, some of those issues around the permits, then, you know, whether or not special events permits supersede these or not, things like that, where um, there might be some uh, need for help there. I think, obviously, the special events and emergency services office would be critical in this. So there's some staff work there, too. Um, that I think would be helpful as well. So I think there's a, there is a bit of uh, division of responsibility there. Um, Councilmember Knight. Yeah, just before we designate uh, the pilot going to Fayetteville Street, did, I just want to be clear, did, does does Fayetteville Street want to be the first to do this and have the pilot there, uh, Bill, or is there a little bit more work to do? It sounds yeah. like you haven't had at least formal conversations with business owners and other Correct. stakeholders, but is that... 
Yeah, so there, there would need to be some more work there on what that would look like. So I think, you know, it uh, sounds like the, the committee's interested in a pilot project in a portion of downtown. So I think some of what we would need to do is some of that community engagement on that. Take a look a little bit as well at where the businesses are and everything um, so that we understand, you know, if boundaries are drawn and people are on one side of the line or another. That could be um, something that you would need to consider as a committee. So um, I'd say that it sounds like there's interest in, you know, looking at it in, you know, a more distressed part of downtown relative to, you know, how they've been impacted the last few years. There might be an opportunity to come back with some uh, options there, whether that's yeah. just the street itself, the district, uh, several blocks, and, and give you a sense of that. And ultimately, you all decide what you want to do in terms of where those lines are. So given that, I mean, I, I'm interested in doing it this one at a time, or at least having one initial, you can call it a pilot program, you can call it which one, but I also don't want to get, obviously, Fable Street area is is the first, you know, what comes to mind for everybody, but I don't want to get stuck on, I don't want to get slowed down by putting it somewhere appropriate just because of uh, whatever you want to call it, politics, the sort of the level of commitment we'd have to get um, from, from downtown. Um, so would it be quicker just to say pilot program um, and get moving on figuring that out as opposed to saying pilot program on Fable Street and then we're going like, whoa, we get into it, we're like, uh, you know, whoa. they're going to be ready. So I do support a, a going one at a time, uh, designating, uh, figuring out which one that should be, but is it Fable Street? I don't know yet. Well, it sounds like staff's going to have to do some work on social districts, regardless of where it is. And if it, wherever it's going to be, there's going to have to be engagement with the business. So I would think that today we would direct staff to um, work on some of the specifics that Mr. King mentioned. Um, and then if we do think that, I do think we're going to have to give some direction. And, and I think based on what we've seen and heard over the past year, two years, three years, Fable Street would be the, make the most sense. So I think we could give direction for, for Bill to pull together that task force and then report back. And, and then if, it, if it's not going to work in Fable Street, then we pivot. But, but my, my preference would be to, to empower staff to work on the specifics um, from a regulatory standpoint for social districts and then instruct um, Mr. King or staff to move forward with the uh, task force for Fayetteville Street and to come back with some information that may help form a more uh, concrete recommendation that we have to make to the, to the full council. I would second that. All right, I, so agree, I agree with that. I think staff can really let us know this quicker than, than saying it right here where we're gonna go first. And I think Mr. Ellen had a, some comments to make. Yeah. From the if that's okay with Chairman Melton, uh, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of things that the comments that were made and, and Mayor Baldwin referenced the Midtown Alliance. I will say I understand that Durham, while they're looking also at downtown Durham, they're also potentially looking at the streets of South Point as as a area because of the outside entertainment areas and some of that. And I don't know if, if at some point that's sort of a non traditional one as opposed to an actual what we think of as a street, but that's one that is also my understanding is, is being considered. I did. You know, part of the thing on the webinar that Bill put on and was so good, there were some um, some of the towns were saying it it really also helped with with tourism traffic of people that came in town for a meeting. And I do think about the Sheraton and the Marriott and the Convention Center and having people sort of flow up, whether they're headed to Beasley's or they're headed somewhere else up you know up, up Fayetteville Street or in this area. You know, there is some education obviously that goes along with that through the through somebody like the Sheraton or the Marriott. With their customers, but I think that's also something because people don't stay at one place; they are able, they're able to sort of move and see various parts of the city, which I also think is is, is really beneficial. And then finally, um, as you're doing your task force work, and and I I really found beneficial the the comments from some of the people that Bill was able to get on from some towns outside of North Carolina, like Huntsville, that started I think with one and now has four. But also maybe it might be worth you know again getting somebody from Kannapolis or somebody like that to just sort of say here's sort of some of the things we considered or here's what we walked through. I think some of the comments from, I think it was Grand Rapids, it was really interesting of, they started out, I think on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they ended up going to, I think seven days a week, just so they didn't cause confusion uh, with folks. And then they also lowered that, you know, they, they compressed their hours. They didn't want, want it going till 2 a.m. Um, of people getting out of the bars and being able to walk around. So, you know, they shut it off, I think at nine o'clock, I believe, you know, so, some of those considerations, some of some of these other towns have are have 
witnessed this have gone through it and, and probably can offer some good suggestions as if you move forward, those might be some good things to consider as you, as you go. Let me say this selfishly, anything you can do to help with Fayetteville Street, I would certainly appreciate as somebody that's on Fayetteville Street. So uh, we're, we're all, we're, we're very much uh, encouraged by by that. So, but but again, I also just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here and be a resource. And should you have additional questions, I'm happy to help and uh, many of you know how to get in touch with me, but we greatly appreciate the, the opportunity. Again, this was something for us that we're just trying to figure out how to help drive traffic back into businesses that were so detrimentally hit from COVID. So, so we appreciate your, your interest in this subject matter. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, um, I just want to say that I think we need to focus on getting this right and not rushing because this is a sensitive issue. I lived through it um, before. Um, we had a number of committee meetings around around those issues. And I wanna make sure everybody's on board. So I think getting together this task force is gonna be really important. I think some of the things that we'll need to look at are the hours because that's what I could see being um, delicate. Um, but Bill, you've, you've been there, done this. Um, I think moving forward and getting that group together um, would be a great first step. And then we do our, our part. But I think, like I said, let's get this right. I agree. Um, and I also think, you know, we've got a little bit of time. It's, it's still February and the weather is touchy. Um, hopefully we can move this forward with, um, with priority, but not rush it. And so I, I agree with the mayor's comments. Um, all right, so I guess I'll make a motion. I would move that we, um, you know, we authorize staff to begin working on, I guess, the specifics regulatory pieces of, of social districts, um, specifically how they interact with the special use permits. I think there were some, um, the issues with the cups and the signage and, you know, stickers for the windows, those specific things. Come back with some ideas for that. At the same time, enforcement, yes. So um, the things I guess that are listed in the statute as well as Mr. King's proposal, um, sorry, Mr. Um, Mr. Ellen's proposal uh, slides. And then let's also um, authorize staff to work with Downtown Raleigh Alliance on a task force or engagement group. Um, that can help further form our recommendations to the full council, including um, whether Fayetteville Street is the appropriate place to do this pilot. So that would be my that would be my motion. Second. Second by Mayor Baldwin. All in favor? That's unanimous. Do we have anything else, Mr. Raleigh? I see your hand going. Oh. No, no, no. I, I am uh, I am good. There is no other business from me, Chairman Milton. So uh, that's all. Okay, so we're going to keep this item in committee until we get it to a more concrete place. Yes, Mayor. Sorry, um, I just want to say I have talked to a number of businesses um, in this area, all of whom have been like begging, <laughs> like begging for this to happen. Um, they see it as an opportunity to, um, you know, a lot of them are behind on their rents. They have not been making money. Um, they have had difficulty hiring employees. Um, I think that the Fayetteville Street area is going to, um, the businesses will be very supportive of this. Um, so having said that, um, I just wanna make sure that we don't lose focus on that. And um, the other thing I wanted to ask before we end is if do we have any um oops sorry um evan i talked to you about this the other day but um city plaza do we have any updates that you can share on um the large screen wi-fi shading a lot of the stuffs that we talked about in the public realm um that the city was um, going to to do. Uh, yes, Mayor, I can give you a couple of quick updates. Um, so I will say 
all of the items that you just touched on, a lot of work is underway on each of those. We are continuing to explore uh, where we can get the funding necessary to do the installation for Wi-Fi in City Plaza. We are actively specking out, uh, if you recall, council approved $400,000 out of ARPA funding for a lot of the enhancements you just spoke to for City Plaza. A significant portion of that was um, dedicated to upgrading sound and light and, and some other things, the sound equipment out there that is being uh, explored and specked out. You will recall we did already do some enhancements to the existing um, tables, chairs. We did some refreshing. We are actively looking at, uh, we'll say, more permanent installation. We are doing that in conjunction because like shade, and I know that I've had this conversation with Bill many times, you know, shade is a big challenge uh, when you're doing a, an event uh, in City Plaza, particularly uh, in the heat, because there is none. So we are mm -hmm. trying to coordinate that as we are looking at things like the screen, because obviously there's sightline implications there. And uh, we want to make sure that everything that we do is additive and not um, detracting from any of the other efforts. So uh, that evaluation is underway. Uh, by the public infrastructure uh, public infrastructure subcommittee, we also anticipate the arrival of our we'll call it the mobile small scale LED screen uh, sometime mid May, approximate timeline. There, I've had conversations with Bill about beginning to think about how we program that, how we deploy that again with the intent to activate in, uh, the downtown area. Um, and we are also concurrent with that. Um, we are uh, engaging a consultant to review options for the placement of a, of a larger scale, I'll call it Times Screen or Times Square esque uh, screen somewhere in the downtown area. So, uh, staff has done a lot of work to identify potential locations for that. And so, we're going to uh, work with the consultant um, to identify the best. Uh, and most feasible place for that installation. So lots of work is ongoing. Uh, you'll start to see much of that here very shortly. Okay, I just want to stress again with the mask mandate ending this Friday, um, I think we'll see businesses start moving back to the office. So activating downtown, we need to treat that with a sense of urgency because we want people coming back here um, we've, we've missed them. Um, the restaurants have missed them. Uh, retail shops have missed them, but, um, we need people coming back downtown. So please, I just want to say that this is urgent. Yeah, I agree. And not just getting them back downtown, but it'd be great if they'd stay after work and, and hang out. And so I think this is extremely important. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for being here. And I look forward to it. Is, guess remember now, are you waving goodbye or is that like, okay. All right. I'll wave goodbye too. <laughs> See y'all later. Bye. Bye everyone.